So, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, so, um, I have posted uh, TAs for all of you, those who are registered. Please check your name is there in the list. And in case it is not there, just get back to uh, me. And uh, I hope you are doing the assignment number one. In case you have any questions or any anything which is not clear in assignment number one, please ask on Piazza list. Or else, if you want some personal time from your TAs, then contact your corresponding TA, and they'll be able to help you. Right? But I would encourage you to post your questions on Piazza so that everybody can be benefited because these questions are. Uh, very general, even I have many questions. <laughs> so I hope that uh, when we have discussions, then um, things will be clearer. Let's start with uh, today's discussion, continuing from yesterday's or day before yesterday's discussion. So we were talking about machine learning so basics. So what exactly is machine learning? Um, so we are looking at one type of machine learning, which is very basic and very uh, easy to understand. So, but this can serve as a foundation for your future um, expeditions in machine learning. So this is called, technically called supervised learning and classification uh, and uh, maybe binary classification so all those terms are not important for now. We can just uh, look at this example and learn from it. Take it as a very basic, very uh, foundational example of machine learning from where you can start learning the whole thing. So OK. So what is this uh, example about? So you remember uh, last time we saw the example of flower classification. So we didn't look at the image of the flowers, but we looked at the height and diameter of the flower. And we said that this is called feature extraction. We extract some features which are, which correspond to the information which we want to extract. Like in this case, that is the name of the flower or the type of the flower. So it's either a rose or a lotus or a jasmine. Um, so how we go about uh, doing this? So machine learning means the machine is learning. Learning from what? Learning from data. The machine learns from data. What kind of data? Uh, we looked at the example of, we looked at a like, very common, uh, a very general representation of machine learning model. This is a function f or a model f, which takes some input vector x and gives out an output a vector y. Uh, in our example of flowers, the vector x was height and diameter, right? And the vector y was which flower type it is. So it could be rose or lotus or jasmine. So it was one of these. So it was a scalar in that case, let's say. Um, so my Input was a vector of 2 cross 1, and output is a vector. OK, we didn't discuss what exactly, but a vector. Uh, it's either a, it's a label, basically, red, uh, sorry, rose, lotus, or jasmine. So now, what is the data? The data is I have, I collect so many flowers of different kinds. So, uh, and I, me I measure their height and dia and the category by hat or target means I, I will notate it with either y hat or t, t for target or y hat for the desired y both are same thing so okay so i got some i measured the height of the flower it was five the diameter was let's say 3.0 which flower it was a lotus let us say i took another flower the height was 4.8 diameter was 2.5 again it was a lotus then i took another flower the height was um, let's say 2.5 the diameter was 
5.2 it was a rose and i took another flower whose height was let's say 2.6 and the diameter was 2.3 which flower it is these are small flowers um, so in this way i keep collecting more and more data uh, i know the input so my x is this so this is my x right these two are like my x and this is my y hat or target and now this is my training data let us say this is my training data uh, so i my goal is that when i feed this data in means when i feed one of these vectors that's a 5.1 comma 3.0 into the model the model should give me output as lotus this is my desired output or my target value now how do i train it that is what uh, we will see uh, in this uh, incoming few lectures okay so let us assume like we saw in the last class also so we are using a linear model with a straight line separating the two classes and we found out the best slope and intercept m and c right now how do i know if my model is good or not so we have to somehow evaluate it how do i evaluate i can evaluate on this same data right i can use the same data for evaluation and i can say oh yes my data is doing my model is doing so well whenever i give a rose it actually predicts the rose right uh, right but um, um that is not sufficient because you know the users or the the people who will be using your model they will be bringing in new new flowers a new a different kind of a rose a different kind of a lotus whose height will not be exactly 5.1 comma 3.0 but will be something else but maybe something around this so uh, so that's why i need to test my model on some unseen data which i have not seen before while training right that is called the test set or the test data so these are the inputs of the test data like x1 target x2 target x1 test x2 test and so on and then i have unseen targets so what does that mean it means that these labels i don't show to my model i just pass the input x and i get the input y whatever it estimates and then i compare that input with the actual values so this these values are also called ground truth ground truth if these are the true values which are hidden but uh, hidden means hidden from the model because we are do doing the testing uh, so they are called ground truth so we compare our estimated values with the ground truth values and from there we can evaluate how accurate is my model does that make sense but well, this is the gist of machine learning so if you understand this if you take this as your basic foundation subsequent lectures and subsequent um, things will be very easy to understand uh, please ask if you have any questions no okay okay so just now we talked about evaluation uh so i have my ground truth values and my model is predicting some values i compare the two and then based on that i tell whether my machine is good or not whether my model is good or not for example i have two people maybe uh nishant and nitesh two people are there so they both of them they make their models uh and i've uh, and i am the i am the user i want to buy somebody's service whose service should i buy i'll go to both of them and um both of both of them have to make sure that their model does better they, does better than the other so how will they do it they will use some evaluation measures which we are going to study now to quantify exactly which model is better right just by uh um uh, i inspection or just by qualitative analysis we might not be able to pinpoint but uh with some quantitative analysis we will be able to tell which model is actually better 
So let's see what are those measures. Okay. One very obvious measure is accuracy, right? How many samples are correct, correctly predicted, divided by total number of samples. If out of, so in this, in this example, what is the accuracy? Can anybody tell please? There are 10 red samples and 10 blue samples. 80%, okay. Uh, good. So this was very um, obvious. So let us now uh, see a very basic uh, representation of performance. That is called a confusion matrix. What is a confusion matrix? Uh, let us say I am detecting roses. Uh, actually, let me take another example. This uh, our go back. Let's go back to our rose, lotus, and uh, jasmine example. So now I'm looking at a three-class classification. I have three classes: roses, la lotuses, and jasmines. Okay. So to remind you, this evaluation is carried out on the test set, not on the training set. So this is so these values are my predicted values, and these values are my ground truth or actual values. Let's say this is a rose, this is a lotus, this is a jasmine. This is a rose, lotus, <coughs> jasmine. So I took an un unseen example, like X, fed into my machine. My machine predicted it is a rose. And the ground truth was, so let's say I write ground truth here and prediction here. My ground truth was a rose. My machine predicted a rose. What should I do? I will increase one hair. I will increase one hair. Earlier, means in the beginning, everything is zero, I assume. Uh, I increase one hair, means the ground truth was rose, my prediction was also a rose. In this way, I next example was a rose, but my machine said it is a jasmine. What should I do? This value, the ground truth is rose, but the prediction is a jasmine, so I will increase one hair. Okay. In this way, I keep going. Uh, my ground truth is a lotus. My machine says it is a rose. What should I do? Uh, can we just tell? Uh, huh? Second row, first column. Because my ground truth is lotus and my prediction is a rose, it will increase it. In this way, I, I count all these. Uh, examples. Let us say I have got 100 test samples. 100 test samples will be something like, okay, let's say 30 roses, 30 lotus, 33 roses, 33 lotuses, 34 jasmines. And I got some distribution around here. In this way, I can get my confusion matrix. Right? Let us choose some numbers. Let us say 20 roses were correct. Uh, uh, 40 came here. 40 came here. Uh, 80 lotuses were found correct, 10, 15 here, 5 here, let's say 50 jasmines were correct, 20 came here, 30 came here, let us say 20 came here, 30 came here. Okay, now can you tell me what is the accuracy? Let me go to the next slide. What is accuracy? Accuracy is number of correct uh, samples or correctly classified samples divided by all the samples. Oh, here I have got 300 samples total. Total 300 samples are there. Huh? Half. Okay. How did you do it? Uh, 80 plus 20 plus 50, which is 150, divided by. Okay, let me write it down here. So your accuracy is 150 upon 300. Very good. This is equal to 50%. So you see, confusion matrix is a very useful thing. It not only tells you one number like accuracy, but it also tells you what is the confusion. So for example, actually it was a rose, but it is confusing with lotuses. So now you yeah, now you know that there is a this is a point of confusion that whenever I give a low rose, uh, my machine is not able to classify it as a rose, but it says it's a, a lotus or a jasmine. Uh, 
similarly, let us look at the example of a jasmine. The jasmine, uh, 50 times it says the correct thing, but 30 times it says it is a lotus, which means the lotus and jasmines are highly confusing. Uh, okay, let me actually correct this example. There is one catch here. Uh, mostly, the trend is that Whenever you find a high confusion here, let's say 80 cross 80, 15, there will be high confusion here also. Uh, let's say this is okay, 60, 20. Okay. So what, what generally I find is when two classes, they confuse with each other, it is generally uh, okay, means they actually confuse. Means, uh, okay, means okay, fine. That is one uh, kind of observation which I have made. Uh, so let us say in this example, the rows and lotuses are confusing so much. Maybe because of same color. Uh, so there might be some reason which uh, this analysis is not telling us. So we have to do further analysis to see what exactly is going wrong, right? So if our model is uh, transparent, it will allow us to do this kind of analysis that what is the cause of the mistake? Can I do something to improve? Can I, let us say, if I'm designing features, can I design my features in such a way that that cause of mistakes can be removed? Okay, so this can be one uh, line of thought. Okay, let's see uh, accuracy. Uh, let us now go to something uh, more uh, interesting. So uh, many times it, it can happen that let us say I'm, I have diseased people and I'm trying to, I, I made a classifier whether somebody is diseased or not, fine. And this disease is very rare disease. Uh, let us say out of 1000 people, only 10 people actually have this disease and the remaining 990 people are actually healthy. I made a classifier and I'm a, so I'm competing with Nitish now. I am supplying one classifier, Nitish is supplying one classifier. So Nitish's classifier is like this. So this is the ground truth and this is the prediction. So this is disease or no disease or let's say uh, no disease or disease. No disease or disease. So Nitish's classifier says out of 990, he says um, 900 times, okay, 9... 60 times versus 30 times and so what is the accuracy of Nitish's classifier? 965 okay 0.965 96% right I, I am little lazy so I made a classifier which actually does not do any classification. It just always says no disease, no disease, no disease, right? So what, what, how will my confusion matrix look like? It always says no disease. I had kind of faked uh, the classifier. What will come here? 990. What will come here? 10. What will come here? What is the accuracy? Huh? 99% accuracy. So whose classifier is better? Now Nitish has to defend himself. He actually did the work. I didn't do any work. I didn't even copy. Anybody can suggest something here? Okay, good. So. Um, so the uh, uh, so the thing is that this uh, this measure is not a good measure to quantify what you actually need. So that's why we have to devise something different. Okay. Uh, let me try to motivate uh, uh, motivate this understanding first. Uh, so what I'm interested in is detecting actually how many people have got the disease, right? So one good measure is uh, out of uh, 10 people, 
how many people my machine could detect that they actually have the disease so what is the answer uh, out of 10 people how many were detected let's say this is nitish's classifier <coughs> so the out of 10 he detected 5 right this is an achievement right out of 10 sick people he was able to detect 5 sick people uh, so this is uh, this is an achievement and this is called the recall okay i will explain this term little later now another thing is that whenever nitish classifier said that there is a disease five times out of 35 there was actually a disease so the that out of 35 five of his predictions were correct Right? That is called, okay, I won't bother you with the terms right now. Okay, let us now look at my, my system. So out of 10, how many did I say correct? I was able to catch zero cases. And, okay, there is no point of discussing uh, when was my machine correct, when, when it actually said yes, because my machine never said yes. So it is zero by zero. <laughs> Determinate. Okay, so can this be a good measure? Can this be a good measure now? Uh, means Nitish system, out of 10 sick people, he was able to recall five sick people. And whenever he said there is a disease, so out of 35 times, five times he actually detected the disease. He actually, the, there was a disease there, right? So this is the idea that these two are good measures of uh, finding something rare okay so these terms are called precision and recall what is precision precision means whenever i am um, hitting the dart look at the figure this look at this figure so whenever i am able to uh, whenever i am hitting it how many times it is actually hitting the bullseye or how many times it is actually hitting the target so that is called precision uh, like whenever I am saying yes, how many times I am actually hitting the target, right? So it is true positive, true positive means you are actually saying yes when there is actually a yes. It means you are, you are detecting the right disease, true positive. Means, uh, positive means what I am predicting and true means the ground truth. So I am predicting positive, ground truth is, truth is also positive, so it is a true positive. And false positive means I am giving a positive, I am saying yes, there is a disease, but actually there is no disease, it's a false positive. Okay, if you look at the figure here, then this is true positive, this is the false positive. Okay, um, so precision means whenever I said there is a disease, uh, how many times were correct? So means whenever I am hitting the dart, how many times it is actually hitting the target? I am releasing the dart that yes, this is a disease. How many times it is actually hitting the target? That is a precision. And recall means, uh, let's say if you go to market and you, uh, you, you didn't carry your uh, shopping list. So you have, to, you have to recall, you have to, okay, maybe there was a, sh means maybe your mother gave a shopping list and you forgot it there. Then you have to recall, you have to, from your memory, you have to tell what all things were there in the list. You have to recall, okay, there was milk. I think uh, she told milk. Okay, take milk. I think she told this. So when finally you will go back with your basket to home, mother will ask, mother will not look for other things. She will look for what she actually asked for, right? And out of that she will see, she, she will say, I, I, I told 10 items to you, you have brought only five items. That is your recall, right? She won't care about other items which you have brought because she doesn't need, it, need them now, maybe later <laughs> she may use. So that is the recall thing. So this is a, a kind of way to remember, okay. If this is clear, if this is not clear, please ask questions. If this is clear, please solve the question. <laughs> so what, what is the, okay, important thing. Precision and recall are defined for detecting some class. So let us say I am detecting roses, like the red ones are the roses. What is the precision of this classifier? What is the precision of this classifier?
And what is the recall of this classifier? And what is the accuracy you have already told? Accuracy is 80%. How will you start? You can start with a confusion matrix. Just draw a confusion matrix and should we do that? Okay, the confusion matrix will be something. This is for detecting roses, right? Is it visible? Uh, okay, let us say this is um, no rows, yes rows, no rows, yes rows. Okay, so whenever my ground truth, this is the, re the red marks are the ground truths. What is the prediction? What is the prediction? No, no. How do you know? Okay, so let us take this example. For this example, what is the ground truth? Rows. What is the prediction? Okay, because it is above the line. Your line is your predictor. So you will get one here. In this way, how many such points are there? Eight of them are there. Okay, let us talk about these red points. What is the ground truth? What is the prediction? Okay. Uh, oh, sorry, it should have been here. I'm sorry. I'm because I'm saying yes means rose is there. Okay, so eight. And so two times the ground truth is rose, but it is saying, no, it is not a rose, right? Okay, now tell me about this point. This point is, ground truth is not a rose. Prediction is not a rose. Where will it go? Here. How many such points are there? Eight. Okay, and what about this point? The ground truth is not a rose. Prediction is? Yes, a rose. So, two here. So, what is the precision? 2 by 10. What is recall? Same. Uh, so, okay, what is? Sorry. <laughs> you are right. 8 by 10. Uh, I was going to show you something which will help you to remember. So, this is. So, this is your, this is your precision and this is your recall. Is this clear? Okay, I think uh, we have, this is important, as I, I discussed one example for this in the last class as well. What was that? What was that example about? What was that example in the last class? Fraud detection. Fraud detection. So in fraud detection, what would you like to have? Let us say the red ones, are, okay. Uh, we have to first define what is my what am I detecting. Let us say my red red ones are uh, the fraud cases, and I am doing fraud detection. Okay, I am doing fraud detection. So what should be high precision or recall? Okay, think think about it a little more carefully. So red ones are my fraud cases. And I'm detecting frauds. Huh? Equal. Recall. You want to have high recall. Anybody else? Recall. Okay. Yeah, correct answer. I want to have high recall, which means I want to catch all the true cases. I want to catch all the true cases. I do not want to leave any case. Even if there are extra cases means I want to shoot as many darts as possible even if some of them miss the target but uh, I want to release as many targets but I don't want to forget I want to buy everything from the 
uh, super store. I don't want to leave any chance uh, for mother to scold. Okay. So, um, okay. So I have got two measures now, precision and recall. Can I get a unified measure which will kind of capture both? Of course, for examples like we are discussing uh, fraud detection or uh, not getting scolded by mother, you need a high recall. Uh, but let us say I want to get, in general, I want to find a unified measure which will use both precision as well as recall, uh, which I can use to substitute my accuracy measure. That is called an F score or F1 score or F measure or F1 measure. So the thing is this, what it does, it takes the harmonic mean of precision and recall. It takes the harmonic mean of precision and recall. If the precision is high, okay, let me tell you the reason why do we take a harmonic mean and not anything else. This is my F measure, precision, recall. Okay, if my precision is high, recall is high, F measure will be, F measure will be high or low? High, good. Take an example, let's say my precision is 100%, which, is, which means my precision is 1. My F will be equal to 1 into 1 into 2, okay, 2 was there, divided by 1 plus 1, which is equal to 100%. So my F measure is also 1. So, okay, if my precision is high and recall is low, my F measure will be, F measure will be, take an example. Let us say my precision is 1, recall is 0 0.1 divided by 1.1. This is equal to 0 0.2 divided by 1.1, which is, let us say, approximately 19 or 18 percent, 0.18. So when my precision is high but recall is low, F measure is actually very low, right? If my, similarly, if my precision is low, recall is high, it will be same thing, because symmetric, right? If my precision is low, recall is low, F measure will be obviously low, because let us say, if my both are 1, 0 0.1 into 0 0.1, divide by 0.1 plus 0.1, this is equal to 0 0.1, right? So basically, F measure is closer to the smaller value. Which value, whichever value is small, my F measure is closer to that. Okay, that's why F measure is used as the as a good measure to combine precision and recall. Okay, now let us discuss one more measure, which is a little tricky. In this example, we just cal just now we calculated uh, what is the accuracy, 80%. What are the precision and recall? Again, 80%, 80%. Let us say now I am working for fraud detection case. What will I do? I will move my line, right? We discussed this point last, in the last class. So I will move my line to here, let us say. Let me, let me write down. Okay, my precision and recall. So my precision and recall was 0 0.8, 0 0.8. Now what is the precision and recall? What is the precision now? Precision is, precision is one, very good. And recall is, what is the recall? Oh, I'm sorry. Recall is one, not precision. Precision is uh, 0 0.6. Very good. Uh, 10 and are you sure? Uh, I want to measure how many are correct. 10 are correct. And in this one, six are correct, four are here, zero are here. Okay. 
so what is my recall now recall is uh, recall is one recall is one i did a mistake i'm sorry yes now it is correct 10 upon 4 uh 10 upon 14 right okay so in this way if i change my uh threshold okay so what am i changing if i am moving my line what am i changing i am changing my c intercept right like here everything i am changing my intercept i don't change the slope i just change my intercept and i move it in different so okay let us take it here this extreme what is the precision here what is the precision here precision is precision is 1 and what is the recall recall is uh one out of 10 0.1 right correct okay now let us move let me move my line somewhere here precision is precision is precision is very bad which means about 19 upon 20 oh. precision is 10 by 19 very good precision is 10 by 19 and recall is 1 so if you, if i now plot how my precision and recall change uh so if my precision is one recall is small recall is large precision is small ultimately it reaches a recall of one it reaches a precision of one this is called the roc curve which basically means um if i change my threshold now just by adjusting my threshold i can choose my operating point what is the meaning of operating point this is the operating point like which model do i actually want do i want this model or do i want this model this is called the operating point i can choose my operating point which means okay i may choose a point where both precision and recall are same or i may choose a point where precision is large or the recall is large but the precision is small right uh, actually in this case it becomes a straight line after some time and this one also becomes a straight line after some time because recall which is the maximum value and precision is just keeps dropping okay uh okay so this was the thing uh is this clear is this clear okay some practice problems give some example tasks where we need high precision but recall can be somewhat compromised and similarly give some example tasks where we need high recall but precision can be somewhat compromised we saw the the second uh, the example for the second question some example tasks which need high recall but precision can be compromised which one was that fraud detection so this you can think about it there can be so many problems where you actually need high precision but less recall is all right okay now we will be discussing something about general machine learning thing this i want to do it today because we have three holidays coming next so you can think about it and we can do some assignment on this uh so how do we actually carry out machine learning in real life number 1 we fix our goal okay let us say classification of flowers into three classes or fraud detection which is classification into two classes fraud or not fraud 
or it could be email spam detection, again binary classification. It could be face recognition, which could be, let's say you have 10 users registered, you want to recognize 10 faces plus one, uh, none of the above. So total 11 classes, right? Right or not? Okay, so, so you fix your goal. What do you want to do? Um, what kind of machine learning model you want, right? And then what is the next step? Okay, maybe I should ask you. What will you do next? You fix your goal, okay, this is what I want to do. I want to make a face classifier or I want to make a flower classifier. What is the next step? Huh? Okay, data collection. So what does that mean? I have to collect data. I have to collect relevant data. Uh, I have to collect the kind of data which I would like my users to be giving to me, right? For example, I am doing flower classification. I don't want to work with petals. Like if somebody gives me, if I, if I give somebody gives me just single petal, no, no, I don't want that. I want a complete flower, or uh, let us say complete flower and its height and diameter, right? So okay, what is the relevant data? I want to collect that data. Then data variability. Uh, I should select the scope of generalization. For example, I am looking for Indian roses only. I am not looking for British roses. I am not looking for American roses. So I am just considering Indian roses, but within India, all varieties of roses, whatever are available, whether it is North India, South India, East India, West India, I want all kinds of roses. But so I have, I have limited my scope of generalization and I have, uh, uh, now I need data which covers all these uh, areas, right? Should consider, it should cover all this, the data should be sufficiently variable. And an important point to note here is, I want to expand minimum effort. I don't want to take a very difficult task and I spend all my years collecting data. It can happen, so do not uh, do that. So can I find some smart way to collect data which will minimize my efforts uh, considerably? I will give you one very nice example which I was very impressed with. How many of you have used uh, Google Maps? Okay. Uh, in India it is not there because government does not allow, but in uh, other countries you can also have a street view. Right? If you are, let's say if I want to go from here to some place, some marketplace, I can uh, turn on my GPS, my Google map, it will show me exactly, take a left turn, take a right turn, or if uh, I can also see if, if I want to go from here to here, which is the shortest possible route uh, available, right? And now you can think what kind of data must be needed to make this model, even if it is not machine learning, what kind of data will be needed? Somebody has to go and actually tag all the roads, all the streets, and you know, you will be surprised to know, I also could find uh, very narrow pathways, like some, just behind somebody's courtyard. <laughs> Even those uh, ro routes were also shown in the map. When I went there, I could not find the way, but then somebody told me, oh no, there is a very narrow pathway going in the back of somebody's courtyard. <laughs> and uh, I, I could actually go there. Ms. Google was showing the right result. <coughs> can you tell me, uh, how, Ms. can you think of some way, possible way, how could Google collect such data? Huh? Satellite images, like they will be very good suggestion. You can take pictures from satellites, but who will annotate that data? Who will actually mark all the lines? Okay, this is a this is a route. This is a route. Huh? Some people. How much effort is required? Just think of think about it. In a small village. Let's say I was in Oxford. Like it's a small town, and it has got many suburbs. Like, even there, it was perfectly annotated. Perfectly, which route you should take. I was like totally like mesmerized by this. Somebody is actually sitting and doing it. Can that happen? I am sure nobody will do that. If you take satellite photos also, you, you cannot know if there is a path, if everything is covered with trees, right? If there is a narrow path going behind somebody's courtyard, it is covered with trees and everything. You cannot know. It means even manually you cannot annotate that. On? How? How? I mean, how will they, they have some cameras there which are tracking people? Good. Very good. 
So actually, when you carry your mobile phone with you, your signals are always being captured by uh, the GPS system, right? And they can use that, your mobile's location, what are all the routes where mobile phones are passing. They're not tracking people, they're tracking mobile phones. So this was very fascinating. Like people are carrying mobile phones, and so in this way you can collect lots of data with least effort, right, with least effort. Okay, so this is about data collection. Next, uh, data will have so much noise also, right? Data will be noisy. What are the sources of noise? The measuring device could make a noise, right? Like you are measuring flowers and your device has some error. Um, background phenomena. Background phenomena means some flower might be a little old, some might be a bud in a bud stage, or there might be, okay, let us say in speech, uh, you want to collect somebody, pe people's, people's speech data, but people are talking in the background also. That noise also adds up. Mobile phones want to capture signals, but then there is interference from other uh, sources of EM waves. So that's where also errors are introduced into your data. Then data size artifacts. Let us say I am collecting roses from all over India. I collected 1,000 roses. It is possible that I missed some areas, right? I missed so many areas. So that data size, small, I can have finite data size, right? I cannot have infinite data. So that small data size also will have its own artifacts. It could be a biased data. I have more samples from uh, Kanpur, less samples from uh, Andhra Pradesh, let us say. So this is, uh, and outliers, what are outliers? That there might be data points that differ significantly from the normal trend. Generally we find small, small flowers, but one flower for some strange reason might be of very odd size, maybe very large size, or maybe the color is very different, or like you always find outliers, right? Some people are too tall, just uh, randomly, before no reason they are very tall. Some people are too short, that, that could be an outlier. Outlier means not abnormal, but it just means that they don't follow the general trend. <laughs> some people might be extraordinarily sharp, some people might be extraordinarily dumb. So, <laughs> so, um, uh, so, th so that is that is called an outlier. So it is just different from the trend. So in this in this figure, you can see which one is an outlier. The top blue one, right? the odd man out. So it is like, uh, it behaves very differently uh, as compared to other roses. That is an outlier. Okay. Then the next task comes data annotation or labeling. So it, it also involves data cleaning. Like data cleaning means or data curation. It is known by different names. But the idea is this. Now you have collected all the data. There are outliers, there is noise, and there might be unusable data, like they are, they are so noisy or let us say missing values. Somebody recorded the height, for, forgot to enter the width or the diameter. What will you do with that? So you just discard that data. You can discard or you can find some intelligent ways to, in, to, to involve that data also in your training. Uh, but let us say you in the beginning, okay, you just discard that data. So that is called data denoising. There are samples which are not usable, so you discard them and samples which are usable, you take them and do some processing. Very important, make conventions for data labeling. So you have to make conventions. What does that mean? This example is simple, like rose, lotus, jasmine, very obvious classes. How about um, uh, classify uh, let's say I give you okay, I give you uh, some videos and I ask you, can you classify them based on emotion? Is it a happy movie, sad movie, neutral movie, or not movie, you clip, short clip, happy clip, uh, sad clip, and you have to rate it on a scale of uh, 0 to 5, or 1 to 5, let us say, Likert scale. So Likert scale means if it is a happy movie, you give it 5. If it is a sad movie, you give it 1. If it is a very action movie, you give it 5. If it is a cold movie, give it one, right? So you will have so much variation even amongst the annotators, right? So you have to make some conventions for data labeling. There will be boundary cases uh, like 
uh, okay it looks like a happy movie it will take some more time because uh, monday is an extra holiday for you so just wait for 5 10 minutes more is it fine okay so then okay now you got your data you got it labeled also now you have to uh, design good features let's say uh, in the rows you want to extract okay for i can feed the raw image as my input or i can extract some parameters or some features let's say in this case height or diameter or in other cases for example you have we saw some examples right we saw the example of uh, we saw the example of uh, emails when you want to classify them into junk email or um, normal email so how do you do that so you have to um extract some uh, useful keywords maybe if you are if you are constructing your features that way you don't want to use all the keywords you, you you are looking looking for certain keywords you are looking for some spelling mistakes generally it is said that who are people who spam they make a lot of spelling mistakes so that can be a good marker so instead of um, uh, just processing the entire data you might just selectively pick some good features and process them this is called feature design or feature extraction so the basic concept is that you want to find features which are informative which means they are correlated with the task at hand for example just now we discussed in the spam email uh, classification so there are certain keywords which are associated similarly for flower classification the height and diameter might be associated with the type of flower while certain features might not be associated with type of flower for example maybe um i am not sure what can be there okay um let's say if i'm speaking you want to design a speech recognition system if i am speaking i i say yes or no you want to classify it as yes or no then uh my pitch should not matter whether i say yes in a low pitch or yes in a very high pitch does not matter or uh the gender of the speaker should not matter whether a male is speaking or female is speaking because you are interested only in yes or no right so these uh, so so it it means that the features which i should extract they should be informative for the task which i am designing it for the next is invariant they should be invariant to uh factors which are not required for my task just like i discussed now that um when i am speaking yes or no or uh, somebody else speaks yes or no that speaker variability should not uh affect my features if possible so let me extract features which are independent of or invariant of uh, speakers then uh, compact very important uh, if you can find uh, just two features which can do your task why will you go for 100 features right you want to get because you why do you want to keep your features compact because ultimately you are processing them you are storing them you are processing them if it's a huge vector a vector of a uh, huge size then processing power of this processing time will be required storage will be required and your small device might not be sufficient to process all the data so it is very important that you find features which are compact in size as small as possible okay uh then model selection and training okay now now you got your data you extracted good features from there you have your labels also now what do you do so you have got your x you have got your y now come to the middle part which is the model so what do you do you have to find out what model you want to use it could be neural networks it could be svms it could be decision trees it could be uh linear uh, models so you have to choose your model different models have got different trade offs some models are easy to train but low in performance some are very high in performance but uh they need huge amounts of data for training let's say neural networks some are uh very time consuming means they will give good uh, performance but uh, they are very time consuming so you can, means processing a uh, lot of processing is required so you cannot use it for your uh, uh mobile phone let's say uh if you want to deploy it on your mobile phone it will not be possible so okay so you have to uh you you have to find uh, models which are high in performance computationally efficient this might be some criteria uh and then you use your training data 
which is your x and y to find the optimal values of the model parameters your model has got some learnable parameters or tunable parameters like let's say we saw in our example of linear uh, like line what was the learning uh, learnable parameters there slope and intercept so your m is the slope and c is the intercept they are the learnable parameters so basically you find out the optimal values for those then handling noise and outliers even while training so of course while preparing the data you dealt with them but even while training these things will cause a problem to your model so this may lead to problems like overfitting so you might have to use uh, some tricks to avoid those problems we'll discuss some of these uh, tricks today uh, then okay now you got your uh, model ready what do you do then you have to test it right before uh, releasing it to public you want to test it on some uh, uh, some data which you have so you will take some um, unseen data which means which you did not use for training some extra data you take and you find out the performance of your model on that data and very important that variability that your test data uh, should capture some real world variability so that you can uh, guarantee that when your model goes out in the wild in, in in the general public domain it it is not uh performing uh <coughs> very bad as compared to your test data right uh, if you take very easy test samples then you know your model will be doing better but in real world it won't do better then okay then finally you have to deploy your model okay now you are ready that okay this model is really doing very well now you will deploy it to your mobile phones or cloud based service or some uh, hardware and then you release it to first beta users which means you select a limited population or, or a limited like uh, set of users whom you give uh, give the model for using so they will be interacting with the model and if there are some bugs you can immediately find it out there and then you can correct your bugs and then you can also do some further training and finally you release it to the market to the public and then as the model is being used by so many people They, it gathers more data, and you want to use that data to further improve your model. You do error analysis. Where is the model going wrong? And then further go back to step three, which means again you uh, clean the data, annotate it, and again retrain your models. So this keeps on going. Uh, okay. So one good reference which you should read is uh, this book is very good, PRML uh, by Bishop. You can read section one point zero.